Okay, welcome to the 23rd in a series of Phototech Lectures. Today we're very happy to have with us uh, David Cardinal from ProShooters. Uh, he's, uh, he's got a, a raw conversion software program that he sells called Digital Pro, and he's written books on uh, Nikon D1 series cameras. I think the first book that talked about raw files and raw conversion. And he's done a lot of cool stuff in uh, software and photography. He leads uh, like wildlife photo tours to uh, various interesting continents far away. And uh, some of his info over here, if you want to check it out later. Well, let's uh, get into the talk, David. Thanks. Can everybody hear me OK? Great, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Dick, for inviting me. I've known me. quite a few of the Lion Brothers for, for a long time. So it's always fun to do something with them. I worked with Bob and Tom at Sun Microsystems a long time ago. Hey, hi. I know, hi from the tennis court. Since my daughter back there, Anna Cardinal, who um, is one of the few people I know who doesn't shoot raw, she shoots JPEG, but every time she wants to use one of my files, she has to um, work with my raw files. So she's really curious about why she could do all this stuff with raw files and not JPEGs. I said, well, you should come to this talk. Um, I am coming at the subject primarily as a photographer. I do lead photo safaris, and there's some information on that there. But I have a strong technical background, and out of necessity, starting in 2000, started hacking on raw files. Um, and Dick asked me primarily to address the whole topic of raw file formats and raw files, and not as much on raw file processing, because I guess he's already given a talk on the image processing pipeline. However, it's important to know something about that image processing pipeline to even understand what's important about raw file formats. So we'll go back and forth and talk about raw files and about processing raw files. I'd encourage you to ask questions because this talk is a little bit unique. I don't think there are too many audiences that would actually want to come to a talk just on raw file formats. Um, I've given it at, um, not this talk, but a similar talk at Microsoft at one point. It's about the only other place that you know, this is what people want to hang out and hear about. So talk about raw file formats, um, some background on why they're important, what's in them, uh, some thoughts on how they get hacked and why, and issues about them. I think one of the key reasons I was willing to give this talk is I think raw files are a, uh, they're like the global warming of photography, which is, there this problem that's going to mount over the decades at the rate we're going, and it's going to get worse and worse um, in terms of their sustainability and archivability, and we'll talk about that. Um, so it's not something that people notice today, but it's going, to, it's going to grow as a problem, and we'll talk about the future of raw files. Um, the first thing that's, I think, important as a background is why would anybody care about raw files? Does everybody know what raw files are in principle? And, it's a good sign. Um, this is illustrations from an article I wrote for Outdoor Photographer on um, raw files back, got almost five years ago now, when, when it was important to tell people why you would want to use one. And it's simply a raw picture of the Golden Gate Bridge where I changed the white balance from warm to cool. And in that one action, I can now take my, my image, my stock photograph, and use it in two very different ways as kind of a moody evening shot or a morning kind of standard scenic shot. So the raw file, because it's, I was trying to explain this to Anna in the car on the way over, and I guess if you think of it as raw versus cooked, when you have a raw piece of meat, you have a lot of options. You can make it rare or medium or well done, and when you've got a JPEG, it's essentially already been cooked a certain way, and it's not going to be any worse than one of those ways. It's just that once it's already cooked medium well, you can't go back and make it rare anymore. So um, the industry, I think, has done a disservice by saying raws are better than JPEG. And I think that's kind of bogus. It's like saying a raw steak is better than a cooked steak. It's not. It's just that you have more options on how you cook it. And that's where the benefit of raw is delayed processing. Yes? If you want to do things like noise reduction, the software which which does this only works in raw files, so this is something you cannot do with a JPEG. Ah, but see, that's, that's, that's putting the cooking step out of order, I think. Oh, I was supposed to repeat the question. The question is, what about things like noise reduction that can only be done with raw files? The, the trick, see, that's part of the cooking. So say you took that same noise reduction software and you put it in the camera, it would be part of, that, 
the point is you can, you can do everything to get to that JPEG when at some point the camera does have a lot of noise reduction software in it. So the key isn't that, I mean, your, your it's point's- limited It's limited because it has to be done in the camera, but it's, it's not limited conceptually. It's only limited because the camera in, in size, if, in a sense, is limited. In time. In time, that's right. So uh, flexibility is huge, that's right. You know, that once it's a JPEG, you can't go back and undo things. But the point is it's not necessarily a worse image. It's just been cooked a certain way. Maybe it's been cooked in a microwave instead of a really nice wood-fired oven or whatever. But it's not that because you shoot raw, you get a better picture. You just have more options to create possibly better results. Well, I think it's important because it, the camera companies all talk about it like if you don't shoot raw, you know, you're you're like getting shitty pictures or something like that, and it's 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 a little bit misleading. So sure, you can. I shoot I shoot 100,000 raw images a year. Okay, so I'm a huge fan, and I have four different noise reduction softwares that I use on them. So I'm with you as a practical matter. I just the industry has a tendency to oversell this stuff like it's a panacea. Um, so a rough history of raw files. 2000 is practically speaking where they started for most people. Um, boy, the original Foveon might even predate that, although I guess it didn't have raw files anybody could use. Okay. Uh, that was the D1, and the only software that would process it was Nikon Capture, which is a $500 piece of software at the time. Uh, 2001 saw the beginning of a third-party raw market. The Nikon D1X came out. I think Canon got its first DSLR out by then. Uh, we had Digital Pro in the market by then. Um, Eric Hyman had Bibble on the market, and Dave Coffin had a freeware converter, DC Raw. Um, all three products are still there, but they're now um, lots of other products, obviously, and especially Adobe and Apple um, both do a lot of raw conversion. And you guys in Picasa have raw, although most people who have raw converters either start with David Coffin's code or they license Eric's libraries from Bibble. I don't know if Picasa did one of those things or not, but they might have. Typically, that's what most people do. More recently, there's uh, cameras that'll shoot both a raw and a finished JPEG. There's compressed raw, we'll talk about that. And then um, now there's more and more support for raw files in um, various pieces of platform software in the Apple OS, um, Adobe and its products through Camera Raw. And we'll talk about the white balance flap as well. And um, wh one of the things I think has gotten exciting and, and a little bit confusing is that one of the things people like the most about RAW, I think, is the non-destructive editing notion that your settings in Camera Raw, or your RAW converter, can be maintained separately from your RAW file. Well, of course, people are now realizing that that same thing could be applied to any image format. So you're starting to get non-destructive editors that are bridging the gap between the RAW processors and full editors, like Light Zone from Lightcrafts, Lightroom, Camera Raw itself, um, Aperture. So it's, um, I think it'll be interesting over time as the industry figures out which of these capabilities are features of raw files and which ones are just features of a future editing paradigm that involves a lot of non-destructive image processing. Okay, the meat. Um, and I, I've tried to put somewhat appropriate pictures alongside the words here. So it's like the opposite of in Stephen Colbert, they have the thing called the word where he's, he talks and they show weird words. Well, I'm gonna talk and show weird pictures. These lines are, it's a, my meat picture. I don't get to use this very often, but they're eating this, uh, what's left of this water buffalo. Um, one thing every raw file has in common is fundamentally the image data, which, which I guess go without saying. In almost all cases that we care about, the image data is a 12-bit integer from 0 to 4095, um, which approximately represents the voltage or the photon count or whatever at that photosensor site. And in the beginning, uh, those were very simply encoded and they just slammed down 12 bits, 12 bits, 12 bits, 12 bits. And then people started to figure out that they could compress them, they could encode them different ways, uh, they could get clever about them, they could encrypt them. 
Um, and then so there's a lot more options for encoding. But basically, it's a linear encoding at each sensor site, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail. For the most part, sites are in a, a bare array, and I'll show you a picture of that for people who don't know what it is. But it's a, um, a color layout that allows you to do RGB um, with monochrome sensors, so or photo sites. So in, the, in your camera sensor, and this probably most of you guys already know this, the sensor itself is, is not color sensitive. It's just a photon electron counter or photon counter. Um, but on top of that is a little micro lens with some spectral response curve that only allows, or mostly only allows, um, light to come through that's in some set of wavelengths. And in order to create multiple colors, the typical way to do that is you have some sites that are approximately green, some that are red, and some that are blue. Now, some cameras, uh, some of the Coolpix models, for example, do that with a CMY instead of an RGB, or they used to. I don't think they do anymore. Um, so there are some other ways to do that. There's also the Sony um, uses an emerald fourth color. And then, of course, there's a Foveon or Dickwork, which uses a whole different system where they, they actually have multiple color renditions from a single photo site. But for the most part, they use one of these bare arrays that I'll show you. And as a result, what you wind up with is you don't really get RGB. You get this sort of, at each place, you get how many photons corresponded to a particular spectral uh, piece of the spectrum. So to illustrate that, I'm going to take this race car image and just take a little tiny piece of the seven off the race car um, and show you a little bit of what that looks like as we go through. This is how that looks through the image pipeline. This is the raw data that you would see if you actually looked at the bare array. You can see it's green, blue, red, green, green, blue, red, green. Um, and they start, and in the file format, there's normally a field that actually tells you what the bare array layout is and which color it starts with. And for the most part, the camera vendors actually use that, which is nice. It's one of the few pieces of the raw file format that's actually more or less self-describing, is the bare array layout. Um, when you interpolate it, you get to here. You then have to tone map it, color correct it, and we'll talk about some of these stages to get to the final image. But that's when people talk about raw file formats and the work they have to do to process them, it starts to look like that as you go along. So that's the actual sensor data. Now you can see a couple things about the sensor data. Uh, one is it's really dark because display outputs are used to this kind of gamma ramp where we really bump up the midtones and the device, the input device is linear. So it has to be tone mapped. Um, you also can't see too easily from here, but um, the reds are very, very muted, and we'll talk about why that is, and that's not true of all cameras. So another tricky part with the raw image is it's not, um, all colors don't have to be created equal, and the camera vendors have started monkeying with these uh, micro lenses to give them the maximum rendered gamut on the output side, but as a result, the actual raw data looks worse and worse in a lot of ways. Um, so the first D1, then when it came out, the raw image, when you just displayed it on a screen, actually looked pretty good because the sensor itself was calibrated uh, by eye, I think, not, not by machine, to look like an NTSC television, to basically play out an NTSC. Uh, but what they realized was that limited the gamut of the camera NTSC. And so what they decided to do after that was actually play with all the primaries, all the, the micro lenses, in such a way that they could get the maximum possible theoretical gamut, but the actual pre-processed image started to look awful. And then it had to be you know, ground up with a set of mathematical transformations like the matrices Dick was talking about in his talk to get you into something you could actually read. So for people looking at raw file formats, just finding the image data initially was like, hey, great, we have the image, we can display it. And then suddenly the new cameras came out and like, well, wait a minute, we're displaying it, it looks awful. <laughs> What's wrong? And then it's like, okay, we have to now do more and more math and more and more processing. So this is a typical bear pattern. Um, 
There are twice as many green photosites because the human eye is really sensitive to green as a substitute for luminance, and it's in the middle. So it makes it more important. That's not why that image looks green, uh, necessarily. It's also because these reds have been very muted. Any questions so far? Is this making sense to people? So, uh, yeah. When we talk about the resolutions of the sensor, uh, it has a resolution pulse as very present. Yeah, that's a trick, except for the Foveon marketing brochure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry. The, the question was, when we talk about the resolution of the sensor, are we talking about the resolution in photosites or in, if you will, true pixels? And this is, this is one of the issues Foveon's had, is that the way the industry talks about it, it's strictly photosites. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This would be eight by whatever. And you sort of kind of can generate eight pixels from that, but you're inventing two thirds of the data, right? Because at each pixel, you only have one color. And you can get better and better at inventing the two thirds of the data. Um, and interpolation algorithms are getting better, but you're inventing it. And one of the, the tricky parts in the Foveon sensor, you got all three colors at each site, but the apparent resolution spec wasn't as high so they were having this problem of like, well, a three, they were trying to say a three megapixel Foveon was as good as a like eight megapixel or 10 megapixel bear array camera, but that's a very hard argument for people to get because they're used to like, well, how many megapixels is it? And uh, so yeah, the, the way the industry agreed to count is that each of these is a separate pixel. And it's an issue because as these guys get smaller, the noise gets worse and worse um, and you now have because each you know, set of colors is broken up into here, you have a lot of noise artifacting going on when those pixels get small. And um, it's gotten to be a, uh, almost a, a dominant problem in some ways because they can now make these 12, 16 megapixel sensors or eight megapixel sensors even in these, I don't know, like this one Canon sent me to play with his seven megapixels or whatever, and it's got a sensor probably that's smaller than my thumbnail. So the noise suppression has gotten to be huge. Um, to give you a sense of how that, the color changes, this is a, the human visual system and what we more or less see is red, green, and blue. Um, you can see in the Nikon D1 Classic, the sensors the micro lenses were kind of tweaked to be quite similar to this, except they had a problem a little bit in the reds where the, cut, the fall off in the reds is quite sharp um, and it, it didn't mirror quite as well. So that was always a trick with the, the original D1. But you could basically get that raw data right out of the bear array, do a real simple bilinear interpretation, and you'd wind up with an image that you could basically send to an editor practically and you sharpen it a little bit and stuff and tone map it. But interestingly, in the D1X and H, for example, and much more common in ca cameras now, is to avoid, um, they did a couple things. They put a sharper IR cutoff filter in. All these cameras have to have an infrared cutoff filter because the silicon is sensitive up to about 1,100 nanometers up into the infrared. And of course, your eye is only sensitive to around 700 nanometers if you look here at most. And if you leave um, that unmasked, it means that if you've got like warm cheeks, they suddenly show up as like a really bright red, which the Canon 1DS had that problem. So people had to use hot mirror filters and all this stuff on their cameras. So instead the vendors put these sharp cutoff IR filters in, but unlike digital signal processing, these, <laughs> you know, these chemical filters have limited accuracy. They can't just slam it down at 700. So as a result, they took a lot of the red out and you wind up with a non-color balanced image. So starting with about 2001, there had to be lookup tables for every camera that gave you um, corrections and essentially they became matrices for the primaries used in the camera, this red, green, and blue, and how you have to multiply them out to get something like the human visual system or actually not to get a Adobe RGB red, green, and blue, or sRGB red, green, and blue, but to be more, more uniform. Um, 
And this, none of this data, well, this data is published. This is all data that um, we figured out, both for the book and for our raw converter, by hooking up um, what's called collimated light, or single frequency light, and shining it on the camera sensor every 10 nanometers from 400 to 700 or 300 to 800, whatever we did. And then watching the, and then taking it and looking at the raw file and looking at the counts at each photo site and basically calculating these things. So this is stuff that in a lab you can do and it gives you a really good analysis of the camera, but the, the camera companies all consider it proprietary. So they don't tell you any of this, which is interesting because in the old days, Kodak with a film curve, or Fuji with a film curve, you could go to their website and they'd have a big chart. Here's the film's response to every kind of light. And that was considered part of the data sheet for the film. Well, it's no longer, now it's proprietary. And that's one reason there's this big dust up about stuff like raw file formats is the camera companies are trying to keep a lot of this secret and the industry spends a lot of time prying secrets out of the raw files and the result is you wind up with a format that's kind of brittle because one side's trying to hide stuff in the format, the other side's trying to get stuff out, and yet at the same time the photographer is kind of stuck in the middle because it's my digital negative now. I'm, I want to keep these raw files for 100 years maybe or 1,000 years just like I could have kept a film negative for 100 years at any rate. Um, so the first step is to interpolate which you can imagine a real simple version is you add up the greens and you know kind of divide by two and fill them in and, uh, and you get something like this. There's a lot of science being done in interpolation algorithms to maximize the signal, minimize the noise, get color accuracy. Uh, so everybody's got some secret sauce involved in there, but fundamentally it's just a, you know, you add divide, simplest case, and that gives you something that looks dark, but at least recognizable. There's another thing that's, um, I won't go into too much because it's more image processing, but if you notice on the sensor, one of the problems you have here, if you have a one pixel wide red object and it falls on a blue column, it's invisible. So you've got a problem that your apparent sensor resolution isn't as high as you'd think because you miss potentially half your colors. So there's a blurring filter, um, technically it's a low pass filter, um, along with the IR filter on your sensor and sometimes it can be removed and sometimes it can't. They call it an anti-aliasing filter. And what it does is it blurs everything by about a half a pixel. So unfortunately we spend all this time and money building the world's sharpest lenses, high resolution sensors, and then we put a blurring filter in front of them, which you then have to sharpen away again later using Photoshop or the camera does it if you have it produce a JPEG or whatever. So that's another thing people get confused about. They look at raw files and they try and figure out the sharpness of their camera or their lens. It's like, well, it's tricky because there's a step in there that's arbitrarily blurred it a little bit. So you have to kind of back that off with some sharpening before you can say you have your, your image of what the sensor saw. Um, yeah, one of the things I found interesting in our raw converter that, that some cameras have non-square uh, pixels. So the D1X, for example, from Nikon is a six megapixel camera, but it's basically like four by one and a half. It's not two by three. So they're rectangular pixels. And at first we thought, oh gosh, how are we gonna interpolate that? Turns out it's really simple. You just feed the the inputs and the outputs and the same algorithm works exactly. Uh, but this whole interpolation stage has all these tricky things. And um, you were asking about how you calculate the resolution. That's another funny one. Nikon has no qualms about saying it's a six megapixel camera, but you can make a theoretical argument that four by one and a half isn't as good as two by three when your output size is two by three. But it's marketing, you know, they don't care. They have six million photo sites, so it's a six million pixel camera. Um, white balance, we're gonna talk about a little bit. That's the next step. And it's separate from, from that color transformation. Uh, the color transformation is to adjust for the fact that the camera 
is tweaked so that all the colors don't come in equally the way the eye sees them. White balance is a different thing. And um, it's something that the camera, the reason I want to talk about this is there's been a big flap about white balance in RAW files recently, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit. Um, the, the camera doesn't adjust for the light source. Like when you come in here and you look at somebody's t-shirt like that, you say that's a white t-shirt. Now, it looks completely different here than if you took it out in the sunlight, but your brain reacting to the visual clues of the environment, the amount of light and the fact that you know most people have white t-shirts or whatever, says okay, that's white and then it kind of correlates everything else. The camera doesn't do that, so that T-shirt in here looks completely different than it does outside. So if I showed you the picture of the two without correcting for it, you'd go, well, that's nuts. T-shirt looks blue or it looks red. So the white balance correction basically is the same as we used to choose different films. It's to make something that's supposed to be white and gray or whatever tone look that same tone um, independent of the light source. Now, the reason that's important in terms of the file format is to some extent the camera can try and figure that out and you can set the white balance on the camera or the cameras all have what's called auto white balance. And in auto white balance the camera tries to figure out what the white balance of the scene is. Now historically cameras were so bad at that nobody really cared what the camera thought because afterwards you could probably do a better job of figuring it out on your own anyway. But um, with the newer cameras, like the D2 series from Nikon, there's an external color temperature sensor on the top of the camera that reads the ambient light. And if you're standing in the same ambient light as your subject, it's very accurate. And therefore, the camera knows the white balance of the scene. Now, if I'm an event photographer and I have 2,000 images I want to get to an editor and I shot them on auto white balance, I want to process those RAWs automatically and use that auto white balance. Um, the, <laughs> the problem was, Nikon decided that it didn't want other people to know what the camera thought the white balance was. So they literally encrypted that data. So you couldn't read it back. So now if I'm Adobe and I have camera raw, say, um, and I want to take those 2,000 files and process them in a, the way with the correct white balance, I couldn't do it. I could look at the image and I could use an algorithm to guess what the white balance was based on the image, but here I have this perfectly good piece of data from a colorimeter, and the vendor, the camera vendor is saying, no, you can't use that. Only our software can use that. And so that's an example of the kind of metadata war that, that starts when this stuff gets hidden and encrypted. Now in that case, they cut a deal, and Adobe now has a special mini SDK from Nikon that lets them read back this particular thing. Now, that encryption's been hacked anyway. It was hacked in 72 hours. Um, and the source is on the web. It's public. Um, so anybody, but Adobe was like, well, we have copyright issues. We don't want to have decryption code without a license. So they had to spend three months negotiating with Nikon, have a little mini SDK to decrypt this data which is in these files that photographers are thinking of as digital negatives that are good for 100 years. And now there's this little turd thing in them, like a little encrypted, instead of it being in some nice ANSI standard, you know, here's the white balance data. Uh, so it's really, it's frustrating as, a, as an industry, I think. Um, simplistically, the other thing that cameras can do, and many of them do, and they put them in the image, which is kind of nice, they don't record the white balance necessarily in Kelvin, um, which I won't go into that too much, but that's, the, that's how warm or cool the light is. They actually put um, a multi multipliers in there for how much to multiply the red color by and the blue color by. So that's a piece of data that's in the raw file for most cameras um, is those multipliers. And these are ones we just picked out from some of the older cameras because it's from the book we did. Um, so if you set your camera to sunny, then the, the image data would have metadata saying multiply the red by 2.5 and 2.15 and the blue by 1.25, et cetera. No question? Is, is green not there because it's always 1.0? I mean, that... Yeah, for white balance, um, yeah, simplistically, really simply, um, generic white balance of a warmer, cool, color temperature is really just about red and blue rotating around the green. 
Now, the truth is there's a lot more complexity than that. And if you look at camera raw, for example, it's got two sliders for, light ba for white balance. And the top one is um, not red and blue. It's like red and yellow, and the bottom one's yellow and green. I forget. But there's two. They've broken it down two different ways. There's also white balance of like fluorescent lights, which are missing pieces of the color spectrum. So like a fluorescent, actually, it's got an internal set of code that doesn't just do this. It actually then does um, muck around trying to amplify certain parts of what it thinks the signal was, because you're, you're missing data when you take a picture under a fluorescent light, because you didn't get a lot of the spectrum. But simplistically, yeah, it's just it rotates red and blue around green. Uh, real quickly, I'm going to go through this piece, because one of the other places that the, the raw file is so important is it's got this full 4096 levels of um, tonality, if you will, from bottom to top. At the end of the day, you can print maybe 100 to 1, if you're lucky. Uh, your display, unless you have a very, very expensive display, is only going to have an 8-bit driver anyway, so it can only display 256 different levels at maximum. Um, so it's not that you need all 4,000 levels. It's that you want to intelligently map them to your output. And to go back to the raw cook thing, what happens, what this shows, by the way, is that, that the funny thing about linear is the top half, the top stop of your image is represented by 2,000 levels. So you have huge tonal variation possible in the brightest part of your image. So the, the part that's the brightest your sensor can hold to half as bright gets 2,000 levels down here. The same ratio of two might only have 128 levels or 64 all the way down to almost no levels. So even though a camera has a theoretical dynamic range of 11 stops, say, realistically, these down here have almost no levels of, um, of tonal variation in them. And then when you add in the noise, um, the top the bottom two or three stops are almost useless anyway because your, your ambient noise is, is more than that. So what happens is the cameras at some point or your raw processor remaps this whole thing into 256 levels for your JPEG or your 8-bit TIFF if you do an 8-bit TIFF. And it tries to map it um, in an intelligent way, but for example, your 2,000 highest, level, highest levels of tone are mapped into 30 levels of tone. On average, that's OK, let's say, because if I'm looking at a scene, I can't really tell apart 2,000 levels of sky. You know, Maybe 30 levels is all I need of my sky. But if for some reason I have a lot of data up here that I wish was down here, I've thrown away big chunks of my original flexibility there. I've tried, remapped my 4,000 levels into 256 levels. So if I can avoid doing that and stick with the raw file, I can do the tonal mapping and change the exposure, like in camera raw or different tools. You can, you can pull the exposure up and down with much less damage to the image. Then once it's been cooked into a JPEG, if I start to pull the exposure up or down, I've got a lot less data to work with, and I start to see artifacts. So if you look at the levels per bit, you can see that with JPEG, you try and even them out, uh, more or less like television does the same thing. Whereas with the linear, it's, it's, not, I mean, it's not the way you'd want it. You want them even. The problem is the evening process also throws away a lot of data in the upper stops that you might wish you had later to do some other kind of processing with. So that tonal mapping, at that same time, it gives you the, the gamma correction. It brightens it up, basically, in the middle. Yes? So I suppose that's why people suggest that you overexpose your image as long as you don't blow the highlights, such that you have this latitude layer. Yes, exactly. There's a very popular thing on the web now, which I'm, I'm a little nervous about, because what it says is, uh, the question is, isn't this why um, people are recommending you overexpose your images? And the answer is yes. 
and saying, look, all the, all the ability to retain detail is up in the top stop. So if you can brighten your image up until you get your subject up in that top stop, you're going to get the most possible shades of tone in it, and then you can post-process it to darken it later. But if you keep it down here, you're not going to have as many shades. The only problem I have with that is I think it's like a lot of advice, if it's taken out of context, it's a real problem. So if you're in the field and you're tinkering with your exposure, even assuming that you're not missing something, and then suddenly the sunlight gets brighter or something changes or you change subjects, it's really easy to have a blown out shot. And the problem is film was pretty forgiving as you got up into the highlights, it had a slow slope. Here, everything after 4095 is white, period. Un unusable, unrecoverable. So the answer is if you're in a controlled lighting situation, absolutely. If you're not, you have to be a little careful or you're going to wind up with some blown shots. How much headroom do you have in the RAW files versus uh, the JPEGs you get out of them? This, uh, if you have a blown highlight in a processed picture, it's not necessarily blown inside the RAW file. So That's right. Boy, I would say a stop more. It's, it's, it depends a lot. And one of the things that's pretty nice now is uh, the newer version, Camera Raw 4 and Bibble, have um, single channel highlight recovery. So what they're, what they're doing is saying, well, if any one of the three channels is not blown, we can still kind of intelligently guess as you back off on them where those might have been based on the one channel we do know. And that's a pretty new phenomenon. That didn't used to be in the raw processor. So it used to be that once, the, once any of these were up above 4095, you were kind of in trouble. But now let's say your red is here, and your blue and your green are here. And a few pixels over, the red is here, and the blue and green are here. It might say, well, you know, we can probably guess when we back off this one you know, where those really are, and we can figure out where to put them. So the highlight recovery tool is, is actually pretty clever and I think adds another half stop or whatever. I mean, it, it's hard to generalize, but... Um, what does it do with the JPEG? Does it darken your entire picture so that it can represent that the value is less than 55 in the output? Oh, you mean when you... Um, when you recover the, those highlights? Oh, the highlight recovery, interesting. I don't know if it even works in... Uh, the newest version of Camera Raw supposedly also works with JPEGs, but I haven't actually tried to see what it does. No, I, I mean, in the output JPEG. What's that? In the... In the... Eventually, you can convert this to JPEG. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But in, in the JPEG, remember, this doesn't really cover any more ground than this. It just re-displays re it, because this space is, is a 2.2 gamma, and this is a 1.0 gamma. So it's it's... It's actually representing the same 0 to 255. All it's doing when it does highlight recovery is that top stop moves into here, and you're just sort of tinkering with where each thing goes. So it's, it's twisting them, that top piece back down and lower. Um, it's just pulling it. Like you, if you have a pixel that's here, here, and here, a simple, a simple rendering Simple interpolation puts it out at maybe you know 270 or something, or above 255. But if I warp those back in, I can now say, all right, now it's at 253 or 251 or something like that. Well, this, this doesn't jive with what you said previously. You said that there's a, uh, about a half hour stop or a stop of headroom in the raw versus the JPEG. Is that would imply that the four 255 in the JPEG does not correspond to the 4096. It instead corresponds to about 3000 in the raw. Oh, okay. It, 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 here's why. It, the top corresponds, but when you look at these values, like 4096 all the way down to like 3900, all map to 254 and 255. I mean, these are just rough approximations of that curve. So like your top 100 tonal values map to one JPEG value if you just do a simple mapping. So, but you can recover all those if you then go, well, wait a minute, let's take those 100, top 100 MITs where all my data is, let's say. I could map them into 100 JPEG values. So the, the endpoints are the same. It's just that this curve is so radical that you're, it, this doesn't even really show it. It's like this. So you're losing this top part up here 
is all mapped into a tiny, tiny space normally. But you can remap that into wherever you want. Um, so I don't, yeah, stop. Is that a stop? I, that's just my rough sense of the total flexibility you get if you're manipulating this in camera raw versus the same thing in a JPEG in Photoshop is you can be about a stop more off um, in terms of the, taking this mapping. Because you're still going to do this mapping. It's just you can completely change it to whatever you want, basically. Um, So just for fun, one of the things we did, we plotted the camera colors. This is what your camera, this is a D1X, I think, or maybe a D1, I forget, actually sees all the way up through the spectrum. This is the theoretical color, what the eye sees, and those are the RGB primaries of like an sRGB. So just to, for example, there's no yellow. There's no point at which the camera sees anything that looks yellow. So the, the firmware or your um, raw processor has to actually figure out from colors that look like this that they're really supposed to look like that. So that, that matrix transformation is pretty, pretty magical in a way. <laughs> you know, it takes this and turns it into that. Now I'll talk a bit more about raw file formats and what's in them too. There are a ton. Um, Nikon has the NEF format. Canon's got CRW, CR2. Um, every camera vendor pretty much has its own at this point. Um, we'll talk about DNG as an attempt to standardize. But for the most part, they're all different. Um, go through the Canon RAW formats. It started out with a CRW file, which was kind of based on TIFF, but there was a lot of metadata in these really squirrely places, uh, which was pretty frustrating. So you had to put a lot of Canon-specific code in even to get the standard metadata out. So then Canon did something I thought was really clever. Um, for the 1DS, they said, well, you know, really, why don't we just make it a multi-page TIFF file? And the first page of the TIFF file will be the thumbnail, and the second page will be the raw image data, because TIFF says I can store image in non-RGB non formats, and we'll just throw it in there. Um, and then it'll, we can make it a .tiff file, and everybody can be happy. And I think maybe if they'd stuck with their guns, it would have been a really good thing. But what happened was a lot of TIFF processors that were used for images had never seen a multi-page TIFF. So as soon as you touch that file in one of those processors, it immediately rewrote it without the second page. So all you had was the thumbnail. So you had people buying this $8,000 camera, shooting these images, and putting it through some sort of image pipeline that turned them literally useless. They were destroying the images. So they were trying to get that fixed in all the software, but instead Canon said, hey, this isn't going to work. <laughs> we can't have people buy our camera and then destroy their images accidentally. Um, so they came up with CR2, which is a pretty good format. It's got the standard metadata in standard places. Um, they more and more use large image previews. One of the, they don't use large image, yes, go ahead. Metadata in standard places, is there a standard? Yeah, sort of. Um, EXIF is the, um, the best standard we have for the camera metadata. Now, that's not for photographer metadata, IPTC, XMP. I mean, there's a, that's a whole separate mess. But in terms of what's the aperture, what's the shutter speed, what's the ISO, EXIF does a pretty good job for anything that's been around for 20 years. <laughs> anything newer than 20 years is become a big problem. So yeah, the, the standard camera metadata is in the EXIF standard places. Uh, large image previews in their high-end cameras, not in their lower-end cameras, because it's one reason they want you to buy the higher-end cameras. They say they left it out on purpose, so they're lower-end cameras. And then it's all different in point and shoots. That's the other thing, of these, which Canon stopped using RAW in their point and shoots. They used to allow it. Um, it's confusing. They say they don't allow, like the G7 would just be such a nice little point and shoot companion for a professional photographer, but it doesn't shoot raw. Whereas up through like the G3 or so, they did. And when asked, they say, well, the image quality isn't good. And it's like mumble jumble. It's like, well, what? To, to your point earlier, you know, you'd think you could do more with a raw file than a JPEG. So 
if it needs help, why don't you give us the raw file and then we can do more processing with it. Uh, unfortunately, though, they've stopped. Um, the only point and shoot now, pretty much, that shoots raw is a couple of the Lumixes from uh, Panasonic. Almost all the rest of the point and shoots, they've gotten rid of the raw capability, uh, which is, is kind of a shame. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh, that'll let you read out the raw file? Oh, that's cool. That might be worth it. I wonder if I did that on a loaner camera, whether they'd be bummed. <laughs> um, so for Nikon, things started out pretty simple. And then uh, Nikon never technically changed the name of their NEF file. It's always been called the NEF file. But they keep monkeying with it. They did one interesting thing here. Um, compressed RAWs from Nikon use a uh, a lookup of about 550 entries. So they're actually encoded using about 9.5 bits with a slight tone curve. So they're like a third of the way to JPEG, uh, which Nikon says is visually lossless, which is mostly but not 100% true. But I do find it really funny that on the one side, the marketing department says, oh, we're all so much better than JPEG. Is this 12 bits instead of 8 bits? And then they say 9.5 bits is identical to 12 bits. So it's like, well, OK, now we're down to one bit you're talking about here. So which is it? You know, Is it the 12 bits that's important, or is it really that ninth bit that's important? Um, yeah, lots of, and lots of metadata changes. Um, one of the things about Nikon that, that's been really frustrating is the camera group doesn't talk to the capture group, which doesn't talk to the other camera groups. So each one can come out with incompatible changes in the file format. And so sometimes you can read the data from the camera files, but as soon as it's been through Nikon Capture, it twists it around in a different way. Um, a classic is byte order. Um, a lot of the, the private metadata from these cameras was always written in the same byte order, no matter what byte order the header of the file set it was in. So you had to write in your, in your processor, you had to go through and say, OK, even though this is an Intel byte order file, we know that on the D100, the private data is always in Motorola byte order, no matter what. Well, then it would go through Nikon Capture software, which might say, well, you know, we think that's stupid. We're just going to change all the data and make it all in Intel format now. Well, except, you know, there's, it was never, there's no way to tell, in a sense, except by saying, oh, look, this is one that's been processed by Capture. So they must have switched all the data. Um, and that sort of thing is really scary, again, if you think about this as your digital negative that you're going to keep on some hard drive for 100 years. And there are just all these little things in there that today we can kind of all keep in our heads and our code, but it's only a matter of time before they start dropping out of the test suites or people start forgetting them. Um, so there's this thing called the maker note in the EXIF standard for everything that's newer than about 20 years, pretty much. And it just grows and grows and grows. And that's a lot of what's in these formats, is these camera vendors, this is not, none of this is documented. This is just straight from our code, where we've figured out what's in each of these tag numbers and what it means by painstaking, looking at images from each camera, changing the settings on the camera, shooting more images, um, comparing notes with other people who do the same thing, and figuring out what each tag is. Like Hue was added in some of the later Nikon cameras, so they just that's the next tag. And then they added saturations, so that's the next tag. They added noise reduction, so you could tell whether it's on or off, the next tag. And they just kept adding these tags. And there's big blobs that we never have figured out. Um, on and on and on. Nikon allows you to download tone curves into the camera. So it's a tone curve tag to say where the tone curve is. So a lot of the data in these raw, yes? Is this just Nikon, or do all the, the old vectors? The same problem. Yeah. Secrecy. Well, boy, um, Nikon and Canon are probably about equal. And I don't know of any other vendor that's really a lot friendlier. I don't spend a lot of time with the rest of the raw file formats. Those are the two that are most interest to me as kind of a 35 millimeter full system shooter. Um, not, I think a couple cameras are starting to use DNG now. But yes, you know? Is it really? Cool. Well, congratulations. Oh, yeah, I should repeat that. Dick Lyon, former CTO of Foveon, wants to make sure we all know that the Foveon maker note is completely documented online. Yes? So I thought that the Panasonic and, and Leica would, would shot in DNG and the new Pentax and so on. Is it the Panasonic that does? I knew somebody was shooting in DNG. I just wasn't sure. And that, that's cool. 
Now, it doesn't mean it's all documented, because DNG allows you to have hidden data, but at least the basic format is documented, the envelope's documented, and a lot of these fields are in DNG because it's a new format. Um, yeah, the encodings of these data can be incredibly obscure is the other thing, especially a Canon and Olympus in their point and shoots had really bizarre image encodings. And you know, thank God for David Coffin to figure them out because they're like the bottom four bits get dropped and moved over to here. A lot of it was to save space and they were kind of doing signal analysis and figuring out on an average image if you encoded the top eight bits and the bottom eight bits separately, it'd be a little smaller, but then they don't document it. So when you see that in a file and try and figure out what you're looking at, it's very hard reading through the bytes to realize that's what they've done. Um, there's padding in some of the cameras and not others out to 16 bits. There's alignment of rows in some of the cameras. There's a bunch of different compression schemes. Some are real simple, like a run length encoding type scheme. Some like the Nikon have a lookup table. Uh, so there's a bunch of different things that go into the raw file, even in the image data, that, again, are not documented any place. Um, so you need to sort of figure them out if you want to pull the data out or um, find somebody else who's done it. Yeah, encryption, there's this big thing, is, is the Nikon white balance encrypted or not? It's encrypted. I mean, it's not, people are like, oh, maybe it's just an accident, and they you know, ran a cipher on it because they didn't know what else to do. Like, no, 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 <laughs> it's encrypted, um, for real. Sony was so concerned about this fourth color, this magic emerald color they came up with, that they encrypted the data from that sensor so no one could figure out the emerald color. Well, 72 hours later, David Coffin had hacked it, um, I think for a competitor, and he posted the code for it on the web. So it did no commercial good to Sony, and now there's millions of cameras out there with encrypted RAW files forever, you know, that are gonna always have to have this little bit of code to decrypt them, so that's too bad. Um, and the legal implications are part of what's a little scary, and the practical implications. Technically, all this stuff can be cracked so far, but legally, companies like Adobe are certainly worried about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, Practically, it's a problem because it means the code bases all get cluttered with all this cruft by camera and by vendor that has to keep being rolled forward. And already, there's 125 cameras supported in Camera Raw, maybe more. And you know, as that number goes up, how many of those are going to stay tested and supported? Because the original cameras are going to break. Oh, so this is the Sony decryption, for example, for Emerald, for those who want it. David Coffin's code, courtesy of him, it's on the web. Um, I, reading his code can sometimes be as hard as actually cracking the encryption yourself, as far as I can tell, but he, it is a real service to the industry. I just find it not the easiest to read. Um, here's some encryption code for Foveon. You can read, so even other vendors who are less well known than Sony and Nikon also did use some encryption. Um, I'm not sure what that was encrypting. I won't, I won't ask Dick, but um, something in there. So there's a lot of these. You can imagine now if you have a raw decoder that's filled with pages and pages of code that looks like this to uncrypt or decrypt different things, you're, you're getting to the point where you're not really building a great archival system for, for your children and their children and generations to come. One of the questions that comes up is really who owns what. As a photographer, I'm real possessive about my images. I get, in the US at least, the right to that image from the minute I click the shutter. But the camera vendor owns the firmware in my camera, even though I've you know, bought the camera, that firmware is still under license from them. And the metadata is written by the firmware, but of course it's part of the image. And it's not really clear to anyone, I don't think, who owns what and has control of what. Because to me, it's like I paid for a camera and has a colorimeter, it records a white balance, I'd like to know what that white balance is. But I can't force Nikon to tell me what that white balance is necessarily. Um, and scarier yet is, is a certain number of people are interpreting the, DM, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to mean that decrypting that metadata, if it's encrypted, is legally challengeable. And if you're a company like Adobe, you don't want to risk Creative Suite 3 being stopped in its tracks over some 
tiny white balance decrypting things, you're just not going to mess with it. You're going to say, hey, we're not going to deal with it. The other problem is that um, because these file formats aren't documented, reading them is bad enough. Writing them is worse. Because now you really have a hard time knowing exactly what bits to put back where to make sure you don't break anything. Uh, the formats are very brittle. Um, very few, only really the small companies write the files back, as far as I know. We do, Bibble does, um, Chris Breeze might. So if you want to add IPTC metadata, for example, to a raw file in an Adobe product, they don't do it. They write an XMP sidecar, they write out it out in the database, they'll write it out in a TIFF file, they will not write it back as a tag or set of tags into the raw file, which is a real issue. Um, so it's too bad. It, these are, the raw files are the hardest to fake. A lot of contests now want you to submit the raw to more or less prove you didn't fake the image. Um, you can fake raw files, but it's hard. Um, I found, and this is a generalization, that depending on the brand you shoot, it affects your opinion of the, how important the whole raw file thing is. Because for the most part, most Canon users use the Adobe Camera Raw either in Lightroom or Photoshop because it does a better job for them than the Canon software. So they're kind of like, hey, as long as Adobe stays on top of it, it's not that big a deal. I just use my Photoshop. I can survive. But for Nikon, interestingly, they actually have really good secret sauce in Capture and Capture NX. And a lot of Nikon users really prefer the rendering from those products. But that means they're kind of scared because they've now, they're worried about raw support from Nikon, which is not exactly a software company necessarily. Um, and the capture instructions are all a blob in the file and Nikon has already de de deprecated some of those instructions. And in either case, the processing of the file from Nikon doesn't look the same as the processing from Adobe because there's no standard for how these things are rendered. So I think the Nikon users are a little more on average, militant and concerned about the undocumented raw files than the Canon users are. Um, the problem, again, if we think of this as a legacy or an archive for the future, is that because these formats are changing and they're not well documented, there's not really, um, I don't think, a good plan for the future. I think it's just a matter of time before people start to have important images from cameras that can no longer be accurately rendered unless they're so important that somebody goes back and sort of reinterprets them and figures them out all over again. So I think there's a lot of this stuff people are trying to put away as being permanent that's not going to be permanent. Um, there are software kits from both vendors. Most people don't use them. They're pretty slow. Um, they're limited, and they don't actually give you access to the raw bits anyway. All they give you is an API into that company's um, own conversion software. So if you're building your own converter, they're not very helpful because what you want is access to the wrong data, to the raw data. Uh, metadata, we talked a little bit about. The file is obviously the best place to put your photographer metadata because that way it stays with the file automatically. Um, but raw files don't really support, uh, most of them have an IPTC segment, so if you're careful and you don't move stuff around too much, you can put IPTC tags in them. But most of them don't support XMP um, at all, which is where the industry is going. And if you update them incorrectly with IPTC, you can render them unviewable, which is a scary thing because there are a lot of internal pointers to the file that aren't documented. And if you don't know what you're moving around and where it needs to be patched, then you can mess up the internal pointers that tell the camera vendor software how to interpret it. So the solutions I've seen to that so far, one is DNG, which is Adobe's digital negative format, uh, which we'll talk about in a sec. The other, which is interesting, is in Vista, um, Canon and Nikon and the other vendors are providing codecs that will do display and print and hopefully also um, tagging of the image files. It's a really embryonic architecture. There's already some issues with the first codecs out there because, as you might imagine, that, that interaction is, is pretty tricky. But I think it's a step in the right direction and hopefully it will force the camera vendors 
to clean up their act a bit in terms of the formats, because now they're going to have these codecs for an operating system that they're also going to need to support and maintain. And I think it'll help clarify some thinking. Um, yeah, a little bit on hacking raw. Hacking raw files it reminds me, this is a Bushman, and, and uh, he dug out this yellow scorpion. It's pretty dangerous and, and has a big sting for us. And, and we said, well, how come it's not biting you? And he goes, well, because I'm a healer from my village. And said, and he says, so the scorpion knows that I'm a healer, so it doesn't, it doesn't bite me. I thought, well, that's kind of like hacking raw files. It's like, well, how do you know you're not breaking anything in the raw file? You know, <laughs> it's, it's tricky. Uh, so to figure out what's in them, the simplest way is really with a hex editor. And you keep changing stuff in the camera. You keep changing settings, look to see what tags change. Uh, or again, find other people who've run those same tests. We did all those charts you saw earlier of the cameras we did either at Pixum or Stanford at some pretty nice imaging labs um, and used MATLAB and Mathematica to run the analysis to come up with all the charts. And it helped us characterize the camera, which helps you build the transformation matrices from the camera's primary colors to Adobe RGB or sRGB. Oh, I'm going to skip that last part. Uh, we wrote our own raw file generator so we can actually generate raw files with arbitrary test patterns. Um, real quick here, DNG, I do think it's technically a great format. Um, it supports all the known metadata. It allows for the vendors to hide stuff. You can keep the original raw bits in there as well. I think it's got to be given to ISO or someone if it's going to work. And the bigger problem is, except for, I guess, it's uh, Panasonic Leica now, um, the big camera vendors aren't supporting it. So something has to cause that to happen, I think, before it's useful. Otherwise, once you put your images into DNG, then if you're a Nikon user, for example, Nikon Capture can't be used on them anymore. So you're sort of stuck with using Adobe software, and you're just kind of moving from the frying pan into the fire. So unless there's critical mass behind it, I think it's going to be really hard for it to take on, take off. So are you saying you cannot re-extract the You can re-extract it. Sorry, I didn't mean to say you couldn't re-extract it. It's just now you're... You know, these things are big, and if you have thousands of them and every one's 20 megabytes, yeah, it's just, so worst case, you could, but it's, as a workflow, it'd be, it's horrible. Um, open Raw, if you're interested, check out the Open Raw website. Um, they're kind of militant and trying to help push this whole idea of an of a open documentation of the raw file formats. And then I think the camera vendors and free enterprise are starting to work because they have so many cameras out there now, they're starting to learn they have to do better documentation for their internal use, if nothing else. And the formats are getting better. Uh, but they're still not safely writable. They still don't support any good way to put XMP in them, as far as I can tell. And um, Adobe certainly doesn't put XMP in them. I think one of the things that could happen is um, organizational pressure. So if the government said for its buying, it's got to be documented, it's got to be an open format. If Reuters, for example, started to say that, which they might pretty soon. Um, when I was at Sun in the 80s, we did that. Just a couple big organizational customers helped push the network file system across the industry because they said, we're just not going to buy a computer that doesn't support it. And it happened relatively quickly all of a sudden, even though lots of individuals had wanted it before that. So I think organizational pressure could be um, could be key there. So that's all I had for remarks. I know I've run over a bit. I'm happy to stay and answer questions if people have time and invite you to take a look at the information. If you want to come and, and do a photo safari or workshop or something, I'd love to have any along. I do them in Africa, Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, Alaska for the grizzly bears, and then some in uh, the rest of North America too, depending on the year. So I do a variety of things. I also run a site called NikonDigital.org or CanonDigital.org, if you prefer to type that URL, which has a lot of articles and information on these kinds of topics and more photographic topics, just information on digital photography in general. And we've got Digital Pro, which is actually an image management software. The raw interpretation stuff was just something we had to do because a lot of the images people want to manage are raw images. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.